Welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. I'm going to stop sharing the um, whiteboard or the, the desktop that I have here. And hide my sharing options and welcome Hannah, you just joined. I'm going to paste into the chat another link to the activity sheet and I'm going to bring the activity sheet down and probably start sharing that in just a minute as well. Um, my name is John Martin and I've got Chelsea Andrews here helping me uh, with today's topic on developing independent learners. One of the things that we're doing this semester in addition to the um, work uh, presenting and sharing in teams, having participants in teams, is we're trying to um, get more and more practical. So in these activity sheets, if you think about them as a resource sheet, one, it's collaborative. So I want you to go in and jump in. Let me just share it right now. And you will see that on this sheet, if I scroll down here, there's a little table there. And this is for you because Active Teaching Labs are participant driven. We don't come in with a sort of a set curriculum that we start off and do a lesson plan, right? We don't have our. Um, a lot of it's improv, right? And we are we are anticipating what you might ask and we're putting them in these resources that we have of the act activity sheet. And we hope that there is something for whatever level you're at, whatever level of comfort. So we have some easy things for you to try and we have some medium things for you to try um, that take a little bit more effort, a little bit more. Um, I don't know commitment, I guess, and then we have some challenging things um, to try as well uh, for those of you who just have things all figured out and and uh, and you already know where you're going. Um, so we try to give something for everybody. But we know that we're not going to so we have this table here um, for you to share your question or obstacle, um, something that you would like us to address in the lab. Fill out that first uh, that first left hand side of the sheet and. Also, if you are here and you know the answer to something that's in that left column, go ahead and offer your corresponding suggestion in the right column because. You know the big secret is that I have teaching experience but I don't have your teaching experience. I've never taught in a wet lab. I've never taught a 500 person lecture. Um, I've never taught probably in your discipline. So different students, different teaching and learning environments. Um, you are not only here as uh, people asking questions, but you are also here to participate um, and to um, help answer each other's questions um, because you have insight that that I don't have and that, that Chelsea doesn't have and that others on the call don't have. So speak up. All right. Um, independent learners. Um, who loves them? Anybody love independent learners? And why? What do you love about independent learners? Go ahead. Um, I see a, a hand raised. It is Kate. Go ahead, Kate. Unmute and tell us what you love about independent learners. Um, I guess what I I mean, from my view of an independent learner, it's someone who's really taking ownership of what they are learning and they're taking initiative. Um, and so they have this like intrinsic motivation that they want to learn for some bigger purpose. And it's not just I have to know this because you're making me learn it. And so they kind of share some of that same joy that I hope that I'm bringing to the classroom. If I'm tracking with what you mean by independent learning, not like independent study. <laughs> right. Well, an independent study is sort of a, an extension of that, right? Yeah. It's an opportunity for those people to sort of get off of our track and go down and explore the problems that they find interesting, right? And you're right. Um, oftentimes in, in traditional education, we try as, as instructors because we need to in order to survive our courses in some ways, right? Um, bring everybody along at the same pace. If you have 50 students and they're all going at different levels and exploring different things, it's really difficult to sort of track all of that and to provide the kind of feedback that you want. And there are some that are going to go down garden paths and totally miss the really important points that we need them to have that we know from our own experience that they need to have in order to get the next points. So it developing the independent learners requires a balance between 
get them following along with everybody else, give them the resources for that. But if they need to sprint ahead a little bit because they've you know caught the scent of that rabbit and they want to go explore that rabbit hole, yes, by all means, unleash them and let them, sorry for the dog metaphors, um, and, uh, and let them go you know, sniff out what is particularly interesting to them. Um, because if they're self-motivated to do that, that means that we don't have to sort of use the stick, carrot and stick analogy, um, or even the carrot analogy, because they're on they're on their own. They're providing their own motivation, and that's that's wonderful. That's a, like a beautiful reprieve for us um, from having to sort of guide them. Um, so it's a nice thing. Let's see. Any other thoughts on on that? Go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like, or um, unmute if if you just want to jump in. Jump into chat. And I'm going to add one more link to the activity sheet in chat so that um, our, our latest guest can join. OK. So as Chelsea and I were putting together this act activity sheet, um, we have an overview of what we think it means um, for independent learning, and this is um, similar to what Kate was talking about. And what I just uh, addressed. And then we have sort of uh, we put together all kinds of resources and then I went through and I said, well, what are the big things that these all of these resources, these practical tips that are farther down on the page have in common? Um, what are sort of the distilling principles? And I think I might have missed some, right? So if I've missed something, please let me know. Jump in and, and share out. But it requires empowering the students. As I said, unleashing them um, to, to go out and explore on their own. Allowing them to um, take risks, um, to have to make those mistakes and have those like little failures, little F failures, so that they can learn from them. And so that in the at the times of assessment, and at the times of uh, real world important um, practice of their skills, they don't make the big F failures, um, but because they've made those little F failures and they've learned from those and they've, I mean, we, we don't know what success looks like unless we've, um, unless we know also what failure looks like, right? I saw Peter has his hand up. Go ahead, Peter. Um, I, I wanted to add, I, I think it's very good what you're saying, but what, what I think is, the beauty of independent learners is if you can can bring them into in a team based approach to share their experiences with the rest of the of the class that's really the trick i think that you want to do because then you can you can kind of like um um make a part of the teaching team which is kind of like you know everybody teaches everybody else and so if you can bring in the independent learning observations of the people into your own teaching. I think that's extremely powerful. Yeah, if we can enlist the students to not only teach each other, but inspire each other, right? Because they're oftentimes we're up at the front of the class. We have our own particular passions and drives and path that we've taken. So we see the world from a perspective that is ours. Um, and oftentimes we are generationally removed from the students who can inspire each other with um, language and references that are more relevant to each other, to them. Um, if you have one star passionate, motivated student who's super excited and shares their excitement, um, that's going to catch other students on fire as well. So yeah, great point. Jerome, go ahead. Yes, hi everybody. Um, I just want to jump in with a question based on, on something that you just said, John, uh, about giving space for students to take risk. Um, it feels increasingly to me like um, our students, maybe especially in the first few years, may be reluctant to take risks. Um, I teach a, a gigantic intro class to uh, um, cultural anthropology, and I see in that class especially, uh, it might be the context, but 
um, when we create opportunities for students to experiment and to do things with either low stakes assignments or assignments that are ungraded, students tend to, majority of them, tend to blow them off and they don't take them seriously. They don't take the opportunity to take a chance. Um, and um, they seem to be motivated and I, under, I understand why. I mean, their GPA matters and they're very much motivated by the grades that they get. So I guess my question is, how do we create the right balance? How do we create things where students are motivated to take the chances because there is a real reward for them in doing so, not just, you know, we get intellectual curiosity because that's where, why we're here, but they don't necessarily get that. So how do we foster that mindset? How do we get something where there's a reward for them? And at the same time, the risks are low enough that they feel like they can explore and they can take a chance. They can fall, they can fail. Um, failing is an important way of learning and our students are often reluctant to to put themselves at risk to fail. Does anyone have a good question? A uh, good response for Jerome? Chelsea, go ahead. Yeah, so I think you brought up a great point about like this low stakes or ungraded or that's sort of a way that we can get students to, you know, engage in sort of this fostering independence or taking a risk. And if you can really um, sort of create a course that is full of low risk and it's not just like here's a couple of low risk and now here's a bunch of high risk stuff that you have to do later um that i think can help foster that um risk taking where each assignment sort of adds up you know across the semester to create their overall grade and so it doesn't feel like there's so much pressure to do really well on those high stakes things and just say like, okay, the low stakes stuff, it just doesn't really matter. I'm not gonna do it now because I'm more focused on the grade on that big overall thing. And so I think that's one way that we can sort of, um, I don't know, foster that ability for students to take a risk, but also making it really evident to students that you encourage risk taking. You know, if we want them to take a risk and we want them to like, think outside of the box or move beyond just um, answering a prompt or, you know, something like that, then we need to make it really evident to our students that we want them to do that because that might not be evident to them that we want them to, you know, take a risk and potentially fail and that it's not the end of the world to fail because, I mean, I'm thinking back to my time as a student, which wasn't all that long ago, and I was a student that didn't want to fail with a lowercase f or a big F. And so um, having instructors that really um, put less of an emphasis on my grade and more of an emphasis on what I could learn and what I could take away from the course, um, that sort of framing, I think I took a lot more away from those classes and was able to grow as an independent learner through those kind of, kind of activities. One of the things that, um, that chemistry does is they share videos of prior students who struggled through the course, um, explaining how it was that they survived and what they gained out of it. So having recent students, people who look and sound like the student, current students, come in and be the messengers of the eat this life cereal, it's good for you, um, rather than you explain that, as from that power dynamic of instructor, I think also helps um, because the students, you know, frankly, they don't they don't fully trust us at the beginning of the semester, right? Uh, it's a thing that we have to sort of work at to earn. Um, and one way to work at to earn that is to show them that, hey, people that look and sound and act like them also struggled with that not quite trusting me about or trusting the process, um, but having them come back in and say, you know, I came in like you, I learned the process, it worked out, here are the things that I learned from that, and here's how I did that. That That's like a head start for the students to be like, okay, well, I might not trust, you know, Jerome, um, but I can trust this person who was in his class last semester, um, who looks and sounds or, or like, like I do. Um, I know that in the School of Human Ecology, I've got uh, I've, uh, a friend who's an instructor, who brings in alumni who have gone on and found you know professional positions and they talk about you know this is what I learned in this class 
And if you have a variety of those, then you're not just modeling. Take my class and learn how to be like me, but you're modeling. Take my class and there are a lot of variety of ways for you to go and you'll learn valuable things regardless of what directions you go. Um, so I, th I think that that might be another way uh, to do that. Bring in others. Don't just rely on yourself. Other people have ideas on that one? John, I was just going to chime in and say that I had done that um, in a course that I teach. I teach a master's capstone seminar uh, for students each spring, and it's a writing intensive course. And um, one, a couple of times I brought in panels of students that successfully completed the course during a previous semester to give a brief talk about yeah. the strategies that they used, um, especially around time management and project management. Those both seem to be the biggest needs of the strategies. How do I do this? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it, there became a trade off with time in, in the class and whether having the students continue to come in um, was worth the amount of time that it took when we were in person online, I actually think would be easier and a little bit more efficient. Um, but one of the other things I do is at the end of every semester, I have uh, students write to me a short paragraph about um, strategies that they would recommend to future students. So yeah, what is it that you think a future student might need to be successful in this class? And then I'm able to take that content and actually share it with new students. Um, I'm trying to search out, you know, creative and fun ways to share that uh, advice for this semester in an online environment, but I, it's been very successful. Yeah, and if you've got repeat, um, repeat assignments, like if you can get students to say, in this assignment I learned da 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 da, -da Put that in the instructions and the directions of themselves. Direction, direction, direction. Quote from previous person who did this on what they learned from it. Direction, direction. Um, whenever we can align very transparently to our students, how what we're asking them to do connects with the goals of their learning and connects and ask them to, to um, not just for the course, but ask them to connect it to their lives to their experiences, to their paths and dreams, because you know it's not a thing that we often do. We're like, I've got to do this thing, but not. We don't do that reflection. Automatically all the time on how can what do how can doing this thing help me in my path? But if I look for those connections purposefully, then I can make those connections and I can be like, OK, I can see how this will help me and that will help me um, do that independently. Chelsea, go ahead. So it's really funny that you mentioned that, John, uh, that specific um, sort of what did I learn and why did I learn it? Because that's actually what I did my dissertation on. <laughs> um, and I incorporated it and I'm also incorporating it again um, into the classes I'm teaching now where students actually keep a weekly course journal. And this is a large lecture course. So this is like a 345 student course. So it can be done in a big course. Um, and students keep a weekly journal where they write down two things that they learned from the last you know, week or set of lectures or whatever the case may be. I have my course set up weekly. And so they pick two topics. They have to summarize those two topics. And then, so that's like 100 words summary and then another 100 words where they connect what they are learning to their lives or the lives of others. And that is just, a phenomenal way to have students think about not only like why am I learning this, but why is it important beyond just like being able to take an exam? And students um, have said in other courses like, oh, it's a great way to review what I've learned across the, you know, across the week. And it was really helpful for, you know, prepping for exams, though in some courses I don't even have exams um, that, you know, reflect uh, the, the same materials and things like that. But overall uh, just a really great way to get students to think about like moving beyond just knowing it to know it and knowing it to actually gain something more fruitful out of it and uh, in the large class I grade that as just a sort of did you write the 200 words like did you do the three things that I asked you to do if you did you get the points but in a smaller class you could turn it into you know a different a more substantially graded assignment if you have a smaller group of students but it can work in a big class too and that's fairly easy to do with google docs using the slash copy um trick and and pm me about that and I'll, i'm happy to dig into more on how to do that um you can i've also seen it done with a google form where after every assignment or the students 
you know, answer those two questions and then they can see the results. And so they have their own sort of ongoing um, thing at the end it's a spreadsheet. So I, I think personally, I think a journal is a little bit easier, but the Google form makes it sort of a, a quick little check check um, thing that they do every week. Good. Um, and it also ties into the, the Wisconsin experience, which is another thing that we're trying to um, connect with um, in these labs. Those skills that are not necessarily content related, but are so important in the disciplines and industries, the ability to you know, be empathetic and humble to each other, um, to be curious, relentlessly curious, like that's, that's independent learning, um, to have some sort of purpose. And as Chelsea was saying, why am I doing this? You know, what is the connection to it? My own dream. Um, and then they have the confidence of saying, I'm going to take these risks and I know that I'm going to fail sometimes, but that's OK. That's part of the learning process. Jerome, go ahead. And just a quick question for Chelsea. Uh, when you give those journal assignments, is it 100 words to answer both questions or 100 words to answer to both summarize and to tie it together? So a total of 200 words for each one of those two things. Yes. I'm just trying to get the, the, the length of the assignment. Yeah, so total of 200 words. Um, and so I, I do tell them it's 100 words for the summary and 100 words for the connection. And then so essentially what the assignment will look like when they turn it in is they'll have two bullet points at the top that say the two things that I want to talk about. And then they'll have their small section, you know, their 100 words, at least 100 words about, you know, summarizing and then a section that says, you know, connection and then their 100 words about their connection. Great, thanks. Makes it really easy to grade as well, where you can mm -hmm. just say, OK, I see two bullet points. I see a section that's called this and I see a section that's called this. Good. All right. Any other questions on that or other things that people would like to talk about before we start um, digging into uh, the questions on the table? And again, I want to uh, um, re-invite everybody to, um, if you aren't comfortable in um, bringing up a question verbally here, um, add it to the table and um, we can we can address it in that way. So any other questions real quick? Peter. Um, one point I wanted to make. Um, I've been experimenting with uh, team based learning approaches for the last number of years, actually. And one thing I find that helps this idea of people being willing to take risks and to be willing to answer something wrong is to it is to have the idea that um, students would, you know, answer questions individually first and then right afterwards they would answer those exact same questions in a team in their own team you know and so the team stays constant throughout the semester but what that does is it creates kind of like an atmosphere where you know like you not only um realize that you answered the question as an individual that you answered the question wrong or not correct, but it gives you exactly right afterwards reasons why that was the case. And it's not because I'm pointing it out, but it's because the team points it out to them. You know, like you have to look at it from this way or from this perspective. And that that is something really beautiful because I, you know, I can just stay on the side and look at the learning occurring. And the beautiful thing about that is that it doesn't even have to be the team that points it out. It might just be that in conversation with the team, I, I am exposed to another perspective that I didn't think about. So I can figure it out myself. And that self-assessment um, is great. You know, if I, if I have success assessing myself and seeing that I don't need to look to the instructor to have the right answer, that's independent learning, right? I don't depend on the instructor to give me the answer. Look at that. I just had a conversation and I came up with the answer myself. Magic. I can do this. Great. Um, think pair share and a lot of these other um, opportunities. Um, what Peter was talking about is an opportunity to um, first think, right? Answer the question myself. And then um, he said join a team, but you could also it could be a team of two people. So it's one and you know you and one other person 
um, who has a discussion about it. Maybe you agree. Maybe you agree with the right answer. Maybe you agree on the wrong answer. Maybe you agree um, or, or disagree with two different answers that are both right or both wrong, um, but it gives you a chance to sort of examine your answers from a different perspective through the perspective of your peer. And it builds that, um, again, not looking to the instructor for the answers, but looking to your team members for answers. So in many ways, when we talk about independent learning, um, we're not just talking about being in a room by myself, coming up with right answers. It's also independent if I can go out on my own and have a discussion with a teammate or find the information, whether it's from a book or a video or resource or another person who's a, a colleague or a peer, and we help each other um, on that. I, I consider that independent as well, I guess. Um, though it's not technically independent. Maybe it is. Good. Um, these resources are on this fantastic um, knowledge based document um, that I have under increased participation um, on the activity sheet here. All right, if there are no other questions, we've got uh, 25 minutes left and we have two questions so far on the um, on the activity sheet that you've brought in. And again, feel free to add more and feel free to add other points and answers to each other's uh, questions as well. Um, so the first concern is my students enter my 300 level course having had no opportunity in the previous three to four years to build a project that follows their own interests, right? That sounds reasonable. That sounds like yes, those first couple of years in the 100 and 200 level courses um, were often led very tightly in packs, you know, from point to point to point, and we look to our instructors to give us checklists of what do I have to do to complete the assignment? And if you don't give me clear instructions and a checklist to sort of check off, it can feel like I get lost. But if you do give me those, then it kind of feels like, well, I don't need to develop these skills on my own for independent thinking, for independent learning, because you're going to supply them. Now all of a sudden we're upperclassmen and we have to start doing this on our own. The instructors are saying, eh, you're juniors, you should be able to figure out how to do this. And you're like, ah, but I don't because I haven't been given that opportunity. So how do you as an instructor of that level help those students who haven't had that experience get that experience? Um, one of the classic ways that I've seen over and over again is the idea of scaffolding, right? This is useful for me too, regardless of the situation. If I can knock off a little assignment that doesn't seem so intimidating as say a 30 page paper or whatever. If I can say go do a lit review. OK, that's a small piece that I can figure out how to do and then write a hypothesis. I can do that as well. If I have to do it all at once, that's too much. But if I can do the individual pieces and then at the end, I'm like, OK, now put them all together like, oh, OK, I can do that. And as I put them together, of course, I'm going to go back in and say, oh, my hypothesis was wrong. I better rework that. But I have the experience of writing a hypothesis. I have the right experience of writing a literature review. So if I need to add more things into that, that's OK. It's, it, it's easier than if I've never had the experience to do all of those pieces uh, together at one time where it seems overwhelming. Um, the small pieces where I can polish each piece individually and then give you the collection. Um, that's great. The other thing about uh, that that's useful in this is peer review. And I know I, I suspect that Peter's going to talk about uh, a little bit about that because if the students can see each other's work, that raises the bar, right? There's a, a term that I used to call perform uh, peer performance, right? It's not just it's not really competition, but hey, I don't want to look bad um, in front of my classmates, so I'm going to do a good job. And then if I see somebody else does a better job, I'm going to go back in and revise to meet that bar. And so things kind of just. Get better because I've got more models, um, more examples of what good looks like and more examples of what bad looks like, right? I can just as easily see that I'm doing a good job if I see one of my uh, colleagues hasn't quite reached that point. And if I do get the opportunity to give the, those people feedback, um, I can I can I can do that. Um, and it's good practice for me to be able to give feedback in a way that's respectful. Again, empathy and humility, 
relentless curiosity, purposeful action, and an intellectual confidence. Peter, go ahead. And remember to unmute. I'm sorry. I, I think my my hand got uh, raised oh, from okay. the last time. <laughs> so. Okay. All right, and somebody else put this um, second paragraph in, and I invite you to unmute and, and explain it if you'd like. Yeah, hi, that was me, uh, Jerome. Um, yeah, this is something that, um, you know, you mentioned, for example, writing a, a hypothesis or, or for us, it would be a thesis for a paper or something like that. And and this could be daunting for students and, and they don't always know it. But if they get to do it several times over and over again uh, and revise and, and see that, well, maybe the first time wasn't quite right. So you do it over, um, you know, same thing if you're doing a lit review, the, the, the first one could be uh, sort, sort of so-so and the second Second one will be better, and then the third one would be great. Um, I, I practiced something uh, this past semester called academic reading circles with one of my code classes, um, and, and um, the first round. This is, this is something where students learn how to read academic texts by doing it over and over through the course of the semester. Um, and they've got diff different roles, and, and they take on a new role each time they go through the exercise. Um, and the first time we did it, 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 it really wasn't good. And, and students were frustrated. I was frustrated. I was like, oh no, this is maybe not gonna work. The second time was a little bit better. And by the end of the semester, students, you know, I asked students, what did you learn? And they were like, wow, I this worked. Like I, I learned how to read academic text. Uh, I feel more confident. I, you know, I enjoyed this part of it and I enjoyed that part of it. So having this sort of repetition built into some of our assignments over the course of the semester is a good way to, to shake off some of that rust. And reading academic texts is a change that people, you need to be trained how to do that. Like mm -hmm. that's not a thing that you just kind of, you spend, you know, your K-12 career learning how to read literature, right? Oftentimes we don't often get the kind of training to be able to say, what do these field of researchers, you know, what does their camp look like and how does it differ from the camp over here that has other things? What are the main theories or main ideas? A lot of that practice, we don't get a, a chance to, to have that. And we need, as, as, as learners, we need anytime that we go into a new area um, we have to figure out what does this area look like? What are the norms in this area that I have to learn in order to be able to be a participant in it, to be able to move from sort of an outside observer towards the center of a, a participant um, and a, a, a valued person in that community of, of uh, practice? Excellent point. Good. And then another uh, answer, scaffold. Um, and, and yes, the strategies. How do I do this? Again, we can learn, we can share how I would do this, John Martin's way of doing um, these things. But I have to recognize that John Martin's way works for John Martin because it's got these weird nuances that won't work for other people. Um, so can I bring in other people to share their own ways? You know, maybe I can have Chelsea for a little guest appearance or guest video on how does Chelsea read um, these things? How does Elizabeth read these things? How does Jerome read these things, etc.? Students, how do you read these things and share your tips and strategies? Again, oftentimes they are more in touch with the daily needs and lives of each other, so they might be able to say, oh, obviously you don't start your work on that till nine o'clock at night. That's not part of John's plan, um, but it might be part of your student's plan, so I can't talk about that, but they they can, and they might find strategies on how to do that. So reward the sharing of those strategies um, because that's that's golden. OK. Any other thoughts on that before we go to the next one? I'm doing a time check. We've got 15 minutes, so feel free to add more um, things to that. We'll have time. Uh, what are some strategies for redirecting um, when the independent learners are going in the wrong direction? And how can we deliver those failures without uh, discouraging students? This is a really great question. And this is this is this is a very common situation, right? Um, 
if you don't have the tools to handle the situation, you can make a mess out of the situation, right? We know we've all probably been down these little happy garden paths where we spend a lot of time and effort and then we end up at the beginning um, having learned nothing um, from that. Um, how do we turn those trips into something where we do learn something? Students are afraid of failure, right? That grade book is front and center. That's sort of the metric um, that they that they look at. And the more points that they accumulate, the better life is for them. And the more that they know that they're being on track to learning and to earning a good grade, which is again the metric that that they're judged by and that they judge themselves by. So can we reward failure? What are the things you can do? The answer is yes. What are the things that you can do in your course that say, give me, you know, wrong answers only, but you know, good wrong answers. Give me a plausible wrong answer um, that shows that garden path and then share that with a class. Um, if the students can see each other going down these wrong paths, they can say, oh, I see how that you went off there. Um, Piazza is a really good tool for that because it lets you pose um, what they call a wicked question, a, a real question, a big question, questions that we don't necessarily have answers to, um, questions that are important in your field. And we can address those, right? And um, if I think back to my 18 year old self, um, fresh out of high school, I had the answers to everything, right? And I could probably answer all these questions like that. Um, they were wrong answers, but I didn't know enough to know that they were wrong answers. The more discussions that I've had with people since those days, uh, the more I see that there are lots of places where I just don't, I can't see um, the folly of my ways um, unless somebody else can point them out to me. Let's encourage that. Let's have you, uh, the students, figure out ways, you know, different ways to burn down the world or to break the system. Um, because, and then identify what was it that broke the system? Um, because we can't know what success looks like unless we also know what failure looks like. In order for us to understand sort of the rules and the underlying systems of whatever the discipline is, whatever the topic, whatever the problem is, we kind of need to know what failure looks like as well. And there's no better way to know what failure looks like than to have experienced it, you know, 20 different ways. Um, because then we can say, oh, it's not that way. It's not that way. It's not that way. Let's try that way. So give them points for failing. Um, celebrate as a class the wrong turns that we've done. Tell your own story as an instructor. Model that. Model falling down flat on your face and then getting up and saying, well, that didn't work. My nose hurts a little bit now because I hit it, but I, I'm better. This is what I learned. This is how I learned it. Um, bring in other people to model that as well and to tell their stories of how failure led them to success. Um, there are so many stories in the world like that, but we just need to change the culture so that we celebrate those. All right, I see some good uh, answers in here. Compliment sandwich. Great job with X. Have you looked at what whatever? I appreciate that you did. The other thing. Um, fantastic positives all around positives. Um, and the more that we do the positives um, and the more we do the negatives, the more the negatives are like, ah, yeah, uh, that was an aspect. One aspect of what I did. I also did these other aspects that were fantastic, so. Good, good feedback. Feedback is feedback. Um, some sex recording demos in a fail of a failure state and strategic revisions that move closer to a success state. This reminds me of a uh, um, John Fotenhauer in um, oh, I'm blanking on the word cold physics cold. What's it called? The physics of coldness. Cyro, Jeanette, uh, whatever. He had students develop um, design elements in a simulation of a uh, submarine or a space shuttle components. They had to choose material, they had to choose the thickness, all these sorts of things. If they failed, the submarine exploded or the space shuttle exploded. And they put a lot of effort and money, uh, time into making that explosion, you know, really dramatic. Um, 
Because that's fun. If you think about video games, one of the fun things to do that many video game players love video games because they can die in amazingly gruesome ways, right? Exciting ways. Um, and it's safe because it's a simulation, um, but they also learn something from that simulation, right? And it's exciting. Um, celebrate those explosive deaths, whatever they look like in your in your area um, so that they can so that the students can learn from both the failure side and the success side. Excellent. Any other questions? Thoughts? Jerome, I see your hand is up, but it might be up from the previous. OK, excellent. Then our last thought is I'm launching my study abroad program in Japan in a virtual format this summer. How do you keep the students self motivated when they won't be traveling beyond the living room? Is that not happening to all to many of us this uh, this semester and since March? I'm curious to hear answers from uh, from you all as well. This is where um, the many people uh, you all have expertise on this. How how have you gotten to this point? Go ahead, Angela. OK, I don't have any expertise in this particular topic. I've never you showed to up a... today, so well, that is demonstrates that you have. Expertise. Uh, no, but I just had a thought, you know, that being stuck at home obviously is not the same as being in Japan, but maybe there's some hands on things that students could do over different parts of the. The course, um, you know, origami or like a tea session or if they have access to a kitchen, maybe they could try cooking. So I know it's very goofy, but at least in spirit, there could be some. I think that hands on tangible things might help a little bit. Um, and if it's in the summer, maybe there's even some outdoor activities. If, if it were now, I would say don't go outside because it's horribly cold, but um, yeah, I don't know. Have you? I don't know who wrote the comment, but have you had any thoughts about those kinds of activities? So I was the one who wrote the comment, and no, this is my first time taking over this uh, uh, program in Japan. But I really love your idea about the hands-on. So, um, so this uh, study abroad program is very unique because. Uh, it's not a typical one where we go uh, land in Japan and there's a different museum, etc. It's really a collaboration partnership with a, a university there where the students go and take classes and then they pair with a Japanese student and then they go in the afternoon, they do field trips within the topic that they just learned in the morning. And uh, yes, so right now I'm trying like to literally use all of your brains to come up with an idea. How do I recreate like this sense that, you know what, we are in Japan right now, even though we are right here, like hot steam weather of medicine. And it, I really like this idea of hands on. And uh, yeah, the origami sounds great because indeed, like uh, the students are always welcome with the origami uh, on the desk when they when they get uh, uh, to the class. Absolutely. And are you going to be able to pair the Japanese students with the students from from here, because I could see doing, you know, virtual tours, virtual tour, or even like you could you could add on to the hands on activities where a Japanese student could share something that they do every day or, you know, like it could be just a little more informal activities. But yeah, definitely tour. I'm sure I could see the Japanese students out with their phones going on a virtual tour. Um, I think I think doing anything you can think of that's hands on and then also any ways to like really just pair up students, even if it's just one student there and one student here, I think that can personalize it a bit more too. So one of the concerns from the Japanese partner is that it's a language barrier. The Japanese students are not that fluent in English and when uh, we are face to face, there's always a faculty there helping the conversation, like you know, translating for the student. So they are worried like how they could manage to do that via Zoom, where it's like going to be like blank stare. So they, they decided they took the extreme case of not including a Japanese student. And I was just like, OK, so I'm left with one of them lectures. And uh, so, uh, but I, yeah, I'm trying to push them to at least, I don't know, use a senior uh, student or, or Japanese student who attended previous uh, uh, the previous years and then and then at least being a little bit more comfortable to to speak with uh, UW students. But 
Agreed. And Jerome, you have your thoughts? Yeah, this might be a, a, an obvious suggestion, but um, it is so easy. I mean, the, the, the fun of going abroad is not just to do like the scholarly stuff or the academic stuff. It's also, you know, the food, the music, um, the, the all environment, you know, the cultural environment that you found yourself in. And this is actually now fairly easy to recreate, to recreate especially with Japan, where the availability, the availability of, of J-pop is, you know, it's there on, you know, on multiple platforms, uh, you know, video games, anime, whatever. Um, so even if there's a language barriers, you could have the Japanese students share with the American students things that they listen to, uh, you know, um, cartoons or shows that they watch. Uh, and it's probably fairly easy for the students on the U.S. side to actually do this. And maybe you can integrate some of these in your in your course by having like a course playlist on Spotify or on another platform, uh, having a, a crunchy roll, <laughs> a list of recommendations for anime, uh, you know, video games. I know that. You know, I've played the Persona video games and, and they're all set in Japanese high schools. And it's actually a great way to immerse yourself in what it would be like to go to a Japanese high school because a good part of the game is chatting with people at the cafeteria. Uh, so, um, you know, the, there's all these ways to virtually recreate a cultural environment, at least within the confine of the course. In in some ways, I, this this could provide a far more intimate experience than they would have had in person because in person they would go out in streets together or or whatever but here it would be like the mundane is 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 sort of the experience that is so fascinating to people who it's not ex mundane for right um so like seeing what they eat seeing what they cook being inside you know their living rooms and and seeing what it, their environment looks like provides an opportunity for an in this this virtual um, format really is a lot more intimate in many ways than being together in a sterile classroom or being together you know in 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 a in a lab or some other environment because we're in each other's faces in ways that we would have you know two years ago been horrified by but now we're kind of getting used to it um, so it's it's kind of a I think there's some great possibilities here. And it's 156. Um, I invite other people to keep on talking about that. Um, but I also want to say that we've got a, a four minutes left. So if you have not um, shared something, you've been waiting for the end of the session to pop it on us, pop away. Um, we're good. Other thoughts? Excellent. Let me point out on the activity sheet, um, we've got 15 broad resources or broad practices. Um, I call these broad practices because I don't give necessarily concrete specifics other than, you know, to say, oh, reward the students for going beyond the status quo, right? I don't say give them two points for whatever in XYZ activity, um, but just sort of figure out what works best for your um, people, uh, for your situation. Sharing your passion, obviously. There are many ways to do this. Um, setting the expectations from the beginning that, hey, this is not going to be a sit back and follow along class. This is going to be a get up and put your ideas and thoughts forward. Um, rewarding the initiative, rewarding connection. Whenever you see that connection between students, say, hey, I like how you guys are helping each other. That's good. Even something as small as I like that you guys are supporting each other. Changes the culture of the classroom from one where we all do independent work and we keep our eyes on our own paper to one where we help each other learn and figure out. Um, where we went wrong, what we're getting right, things like that. It's a subtle but powerful switch. Um, model your own resilience and curiosity. Um, go down those rabbit holes and you know, not too long, of course, off topic, but say, wow, that's a really interesting topic. I'm interested in that as well. Here's how I would, would do this. Projects give the students an opportunity to do that as well on their own. Bring their own ideas to the forefront of what you ask them uh, of what they're doing. Um, sharing with each other what they've done, 
what works, what doesn't work. I've got a whole section. Uh, we've got Chelsea and I put together a whole section down below. I'm um, digging into that, not just having the students teach each other, but learning from other um, teaching their um, family. Uh, write a letter to your younger sibling. Explain what we're talking about to your grandmother. You know, use those different language skills um, to understand your audience and 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 form a uh, cohesive uh, communication um, to the different audiences. That's important when we do this. Predict and envision, um, encourage mistakes, uh, provide them options, different ways to participate. Open ended questions versus closed questions, obviously. Um, pro social activities, uh, pro learning activities. Again, look to the Wisconsin experience for that. Um, there are a couple of others, and then down below that we've got some specifics. And that's what we've got for you this week. Um, thank you all for joining. I appreciate that you came in and played along with us um, as we learn through this format on uh, Microsoft Teams using the uh, Google Docs, etc. And I'll stick around for the next few minutes. Um, if you want to have a, a one on one chat, that'd be great. And if not, have a great um, rest of your January 20th. <laughs>